can going. All righty. Do you guys mind if I go first today? Oh, yeah. All right. I'm kind of swamped work-wise, so I'm going to continue to um, plug away. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I need to share my screen. I've got an interesting case. Uh, it says I'm apparently I'm already sharing my screen. There we go. For you guys, I'm curious if you've ever seen one of these. Um, this is the first time I've seen this. So this patient uh, presented to the emergency department with atrial fibrillation. And he's about six months out from a left upper lobectomy for an early stage lung cancer. And he didn't have a PE, but what he did have is um, this thrombus here in his left superior pulmonary vein stump. So nothing in the atrial appendage, but, uh, and that's the first post-operative CT I have. So. Um, I asked our surgeon about this because I've never seen one. Um, there are there is some literature on it. It's primarily from um, Japan. Uh, they sh they show incidence in the four or five six percent range. But what's interesting is I, I did find a paper. Let me see. I think I have it up still. Uh, or did I close? I think I closed it. Um, I'll I'll send them out with the case. But it used for a MR40 flow to analyze these stumps, and what they found is there's there's turbulent flow in here. It's very similar to a left atrial appendage, so it functions sort of as a left atrial appendage. So my theory is this patient developed atrial fibrillation, which led to poor flow in the left atrium itself. And this is just like a just like an atrial appendage in this thrombus form here. But they can be um, very dangerous. They can embolize, cause there's case reports of stroke, kidney infarcts, uh, splenic infarcts, as you can imagine. So uh, the there's no real good guidelines, but yeah, at least anticoagulation temporarily, uh, but probably for life unless there's a contraindication. Um, but has wow. have any of you ever seen a, and it also I should point out, it's most common after a left superior pulmonary, uh, left upper lobectomy, and that's because it's a relatively long vein uh, from the, even from the intrapericardial ligation. Um, have any of you ever seen this before? I haven't. Nope. I have. How often have you seen one of these, yeah, David? I just assumed it was a flow phenomenon, and I didn't really tumble to the to the risk that that you've indicated is present with these things. Yeah, I I, I was I suspect it. Yeah, it, it seems it's unclear if it occurs in the absence of atrial fibrillation, if it contributes to atrial fibrillation. I suspect it's related to it, but. Um, yeah, I thought it was it was kind of an interesting finding. I see Seth's on it. Seth, have you ever seen a left I have a pulmonary vein stump thrombus after a lobectomy? All right. Well, all right. Well, that was an interesting one. I'll send the articles along with the case. Um, this oh, is sorry, I, I have seen one or two, but not very common. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they are pretty rare. So this is another interesting case of something I have not seen but a common finding. So this patient has a tracheal diverticulum, a pretty sizable one. We see these all the time, right? Usually they're tiny little things. Um, and the only reason I ever mention them is so they're not mistaken for pneumomediastinum or other badness. Um, but this patient presented with neck pain. So this was back uh, when the first patient first, uh, older imaging. The patient presented with some neck pain and uh, so about a year later, and some fever and all that stuff. So they did a neck CT. And what you'll see now, and I'll make it bigger for everyone, is there's now a fluid level in this tracheal diverticulum, and it's got a thick wall to it. Um, and there's some stranding around it. And here's the chest CT done at the same time, which just kind of shows the same thing, just less neck stuff in the way, but no contrast artifact. Oops. But we can see right there, it's got a thick wall. I don't know why that image is bad, but there we go. So um, this is an infected tracheal diverticulum, and I've never seen one get infected before. It makes sense that it could. Uh, you don't always see the communication. Um, and I guess uh, I think the plan with this one was they were going to treat it with antibiotics, but probably have ENT go in and try to resect what they could of this. I don't know how you get it out. It's probably all stuck in there, but um, I've not seen an infected tracheal diverticulum before, so that was kind of cool. I've never seen one, but if I remember correctly, Travis may have shown us one some years ago in a patient with cystic fibrosis, if I remember correctly. 
but I've personally never seen that myself. Yeah, yeah in this case, yeah, th and that would make sense because they're colonized, and they and I've seen CF patients that have multiple tra and very complex tracheal diverticula. I think you're right that he showed one, but uh, this patient, to my knowledge, had no underlying lung disease, so it was just one of these right. institutional things. Okay. Wow. And then I've got um, a set of two cases, um, and I know you, we've talked about this before, but this is the first time I've seen one n uh, not work. So this is an example of a Watchman device, which is uh, used to occlude the left atrial appendage. And this one is properly positioned and functioning, just for reference here. So you can see there's the device there, and it has this little like denser metal component right there, and then the little metal cage. And you'll see that the left atrial appendage is occluded and thrombosed, and it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. And notice the orientation of it. It, it seems to go along the long axis of the orifice, the left atrial appendage, and sort of perpendicular, so well seated in there. This patient um, here uh, presented with some embolic stuff going on, and also has a watchman device but unfortunately this patient is forming clots and you'll see there's a clot here along the uh, right atrial appendage pacing lead there's probably another clot adherent there another clot there but look at this watchman device so there's some clot presumably right along the the the, the base of it if we'll call it that but notice that left atrial appendage is actually filled with contrast so this watchman device is not positioned properly it's aiming, instead of going in this direction, it's aiming more this way. So there's a leak around it, so it's not doing its job. And uh, I think a clot has formed on it right, right, probably about there. So this patient was forming clots. And so uh, we, don't, I'm not, we don't see too many Watchman devices here. I just haven't seen a lot of them, uh, although I've seen a lot in the last week or so, maybe for whatever reason. But this is the first time I've gotten a good CT of um, <coughs> And I happened to find the comparison yesterday of the normal one, but this one it clearly didn't do its job. And so it's a malpositioned one. And I don't know if it dislodged after they placed it or if it was placed incorrectly. We don't we don't know that. My guess is it was probably placed correctly because I suspect they would test them and that somehow it just didn't set. So I have that. So even the clump about that pacemaker lead is unusual. Right. So the patient must be uh, thrombogenic at this point for whatever reason. But you can imagine that a thrombus here is not a good thing to have. Yeah. So, all hmm. right, and then last case is another crazy case. So this is a 57-year-old lady who tripped and <coughs> fell and hit her neck on the uh, footboard of a bed and developed acute neck pain and respiratory distress. And so she was uh, scanned, and you can see there's a bunch of subcutaneous gas. And then when we get down to the level of, you can see the thyroid cricoid cartilages just below, let's see if I can get the one right area there, right? Just below that, um, at the level of the thyroid, we see that the trachea looks very abnormal. I'll change the window here. Uh, and so she fractured her trachea from a blunt injury, and there's all the sub-Q gas there. And so that's a very rare injury. Uh, usually it's penetrating trauma, um, but it was a direct hit. Um, let me show this, the, the, the chest images as well. You can get a sense of what's going on there, uh, right there. Big, big defect. So they took her to the operating room um, urgently uh, with ENT, and they uh, were able to do a primary repair of this. And then they scoped her, and they also found that there was a mucosal tear of the esophagus, and they described it as a, um, like, the, I guess the posterior membrane of the trachea is relatively adherent to the esophagus, at least up high, and that it had torn across there. So it, it rarely can tear all the way through and give you a fistula. She was fortunate enough that that wasn't a pro, that, that it was just a mucosal tear. But I've never seen a, a esophageal injury from blunt trauma either. And then the other thing that can happen is the trachea can detach from the th from the larynx uh, traumatically. They do that surgically for chronic aspirating patients who might be trach dependent, uh, where, they, where they divert it to prevent it. Um, but this was a, tr a severe trauma one. Um, but they didn't take any pictures, so I don't have anything to show for it other than an off note. But uh, just a very severe but rare injury. Luckily, um, they, because of the primary pair, she's breathing OK now. And, and they'll just do tube feeds till this heals. But very odd. But the, the only other tracheal injury I've ever seen um, 
like the ones I've seen are always been, uh, are almost always like this, or have always been penetrating trauma. I saw cases case as a resident of a bullet that went through and caused a tracheoesophageal fistula. Wow. Right. And this what, what is the nature of the blunt injury? Just a forceful? The, she hit the, like the footboard of a bed. So it was a, a hard thing, kind of a bed. narrow, yeah, direct hit. <clears throat> oh, gosh. Yeah, I know. It hurts just looking at the images, but yeah. So very, very rare injury. So a bunch of odd cases this week. So, mm. and also, like I said, I'll send you guys the article about the vein thrombus. All Jeff, right. The the fact that the trachea and the esophagus were injured together there is uh, sort of an important anatomic point. You know, in some of this, in some of the chest radiology distinctions of posterior and middle mediastinum, people try to draw a line between the trachea and the esophagus, but the anatomists emphasize. That the trachea and esophagus are often bound together in a in kind of a connective tissue sheath so diseases of one often affect the other and i think your trauma case is an example of that thank you that's yeah that's good to know and yeah that's what they were concerned about and when they that's why they scoped the esophagus too and um because it, it, you can you know, tear that common sort of posterior adventitial tissues and then lead to a fistula and that may be may that may also explain the high rate of fistulization we see with like cancers in that area. Okay, who would like to go next? Jeff, I can show a related case. All right, well let's see what you got. So this case is related to the uh, diverticulum case that you started out with, that your case was a, probably a congenital diverticulum. This is a cystic fibrosis patient, and this is a chest radiograph showing really junky looking lungs with lots of bronchial abnormalities back in 20, um, this is 2019 before transplant. And this is a CT scan also just before transplant in 2019 with lots of bronchiectasis and a number of paratracheal uh, diverticula that are showing up here. As you said before, cystic fibrosis is a condition that's commonly associated with these things. And, you know, it's like 30 to 60%. So the, the most prominent ones tend to be in that right uh, posterior upper tracheal uh, location near the thoracic inlet, just the way the congenital diverticular tend to be right posterior near the thoracic inlet. But these are probably infected mucosal glands that then dilate and um, I'll show you an article that shows the infectious consequences of this sort of thing. So this is what the person looked like back in 2019. Um, the person had a lung transplant and this is a current chest radiograph with transplanted lungs in place, so all the bronchiectasis is um, long removed and stuff like that. We don't see any tracheal abnormality. And on a current CT, this is from a few days ago, we find that these tracheal diverticula persist. So of course, when they transplant the lungs, they leave the trachea and the proximal bronchi from the uh, native, um, their native condition. And this condition has not gone away here. We actually have more dilation of these divert multiple diverticula. Here's a big one near the right uh, takeoff of the bronchus. You can often see these around the proximal bronchi as well. It's not just tracheal. So this person still has those lesions. And um, let me show you another reservoir for infection. So the importance of these diverticula is that you still have this native tissue these uh, diverticula tend to be infected with the same organisms that affect people with cystic fibrosis, that's Pseudomonas and Staphylococcus and so forth. Uh, another bit of native tissue that can reinfect the transplanted lungs with the same organisms that were there in the cystic fibrosis condition is the sinuses. This person has extensive sinus disease and has had uh, these antrectomies on both sides. So this is another source of infection for the newly transplanted lungs. So the tracheal diverticula, very common in cystic fibrosis, probably present in two thirds of cases. They don't go away after, and as a matter of fact, as in this case, they have enlarged over time. They These diverticula tend to get 
more prominent as cystic fibrosis progresses. Let me show you an article uh, from here that was written on this topic, Tracheal Diverticulate and Advanced Cystic Fibrosis from Dr. Kapnadak et al. And the, this et al, Greg Kitschka, is one of our thoracic radiologists. So they emphasize that these things are extremely common. So the most common location is that um, right posterior near the thoracic inlet. Um, they are infected with the usual organisms that affect cystic fibrosis in the bronchi. There are some interesting uh, pictures here. This was a very large lesion. I have a feeling this may be the case that Howard was referring to. I think I've shown this case in the past of this very large right paratracheal diverticulum in a cystic fibrosis patient. You can see it here uh, with some air filling here on this uh, 3D representation. And um, here's some path specimens. This is a at autopsy, they had two autopsy cases in their series. And this is the pus that was expressed as you push on the outer tracheal wall in this autopsy specimen, you could actually get the this pus up here. It was very hard to determine, to actually see the connect connection between the tracheal lumen and these diverticulates, it's kind of a pinpoint thing. Here's a, uh, a path specimen showing the entry into the submucosal inflamed tissue, and here's a lot of inflammation around a similar. So these people emphasized in the course of this article here that there's a high prevalence of these tracheal diverticula. They become more common as cystic fibrosis progresses and they are a re reservoir of bacterial reinfection of the transplanted lungs. So they didn't identify any um, morbid consequences of this, whether there was an increase in infection in uh, post transplant from other people, they didn't find they didn't have enough statistics to determine that. But they said, be cautious. Okay, so um, just want to make a point that these tracheal diverticula are there, that they don't go away <clears throat> after transplantation, and that they are potentially a reservoir of infection. Thank you. Great. Thanks, David. That was really interesting. All right, who's up next? I can go. All right. I'm trying to see, can I share only a portion of my screen? Is that possible? I, you can pick an application to share, actually. Yeah, that's not going to work. I was just trying to. Um, why don't you? Because I, I have my packs open, but I was going to share just the portion of the screen, but it's going to have PHI. Okay. Um, why don't you skip me now and I'll do something else okay. while I get this ready. Peter or Howard? Yeah, I can go. All right. All right. This one is <clears throat> unusual for sure. And I'm indebted to one of my abdominal imaging colleagues who made the observations on abdominal imaging. So let's see, where should I start here, maybe? So the observation he made, great observation, is focal and asymmetric enlargement, rather substantial, of the crus of the right hemidiaphragm. So there is it, and it is substantially thickened compared to the other side. <clears throat> Get my bearings here. Rather substantially thickened, as you see there. And they evaluated I don't know if they did the MRI to evaluate that. Maybe they did further. So let me show you post ghetto. Let's see if I can get this one. And if I <clears throat> misspeak in describing these MRIs, let me know. So we have immediate and five minutes. And you can see that it takes up gadolinium here. 
So the findings there are consistent with an inflammatory edematous process involving the crus that's focally enlarged right there. And that's the observation. So this turns out to be an observation in the patient that presented with findings of a myopathy. And you can see here that he had a myopathy involving other parts and other muscles in the body, obviously not symptomatic from that cross, and was whipped up for that. And eventually they made a diagnosis based on the clinical presentation, the EMG, as well as a biopsy of inclusion body myositis. So there were some lab findings. This actually turned out to be negative, whatever that is. But the biopsy of the left biceps showed findings consistent with inclusion body myositis. So these are the inclusions that are talked about that they can identify on electron microscopy. But I guess maybe there's an immunohistochemistry thing that one can do for that now. So focal enlargement edema of a cross from inclusion body myositis. Interesting. Wild. It's one of the sort of the category of the so-called idiopathic inflammatory myopathies. This is sort of one of them that goes into that overall category. And, you know, of course, why it involves the crust like this is just random. But he made that great observation. Yeah. Does it ever cause lung disease? No. I don't think so. This is entirely a myopathy. Okay. And there's certain, there's certain um, muscles that are particularly involved with this preferentially when patients present with clinical with uh, clinical symptoms. There's certain muscle groups that seem to be preferentially involved. For example, there you can see there, and sometimes an MRI, there's certain muscles in the thigh. I think the anterior muscles rather than the posterior muscles of the thigh. Let's see what it said there, <clears throat> but no, right there. MRI of the thigh typically shows edema, atrophy, anterior compartment compared to the medial and posterior compartments and so on. So presumably that is <clears throat> part of his disease. Interesting. <laughs> the first one I've seen, of course, and probably the only one I'll ever see. So, um, okay. I like that one because we usually we talk about looking for atrophy. Guys, I've seen some people with diaphragm dysfunction that looks like paralysis, um, and their cruise is not thinned. And some of those cases have been uh, cases of myopathy. So myopathy is, you know, if you're ever evaluating somebody's <clears throat> diaphragm dysfunction, they have normal cruise thickness, but they have weakness or paralysis. Myopathy is a consideration wasn't hypertrophied like this, but it wasn't thinned. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's big because of inflammation, huh? Yeah. Inflammation, yeah. and it's not working. <clears throat> At least if, if, if there's diaphragm dysfunction, it's that the muscle can have normal thickness, but it's not functioning. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, great. Uh, this is interesting because it started off in a funny fashion. So I came to know about this case when a nuclear medicine colleague came over and said, what do you think about the chest radiograph and the VQ scan? And we talked about that. So the <clears throat> conspicuous finding here on the bedside radiograph is dilatation of the main pulmonary artery. And I will show you not necessarily in order, but let me just show you this. And you will see that the perfusion is asymmetric. There is more delivery of radionuclide into the left lung than the right, without defects, of course. But you can see the asymmetry of the radionuclide here, at least. And I don't have a conventional CT, but this is part of the SPECT <clears throat> so that if we look at the relative size, of course, the main pulmonary artery is big, but the relative size, even on the axial sections of the left interlobar pulmonary artery and going down here compared to its companion, it's bigger. 
so there's a nice correspondence between the caliber of this and the delivery of the radionuclide to that left lung preferentially. So then he told me, oh, they heard a murmur. So of course, then we made the diagnosis of pulmonic valvular stenosis. So that's the diagnosis. Then by history, they found out um, in this patient who is from Afghanistan that she probably had a diagnosis made and even an intervention in childhood. But they went on to do an exam here. Now, in this is part of a dilatation procedure, but they injected contrast medium into the main pulmonary artery. And what they discerned, I'm going to try and pick out if I can. And I think that they describe this sort of negative jet of blood coming from the RV as the jet of non contrast opacified blood somewhere in there going through the stenotic segment into the dilated pulmonary artery. And then they proceeded to dilate that. And there's the uh, kind of the waste right there. So pulmonic valvular stenosis um, treated with dilatation for the time being in this patient. So David, you like that left pulmonary artery and the radionuclide and the relative size of that left? Yes, and on the chest radiograph, you could see that the interlobar right pulmonary artery was very scrawny too. So I knew it wasn't going to be pulmonary hypertension because of that discrepancy between left and right. So that interlobar pulmonary artery is really wimpy on the right. <clears throat> yeah, certainly not big. Sure. Yeah, if you have this and you have um, a murmur, yeah, you're on the right track. I'm not quite sure why they did the VQ scan, actually. Maybe she had a syncopal event. I think she had syncopal events, which is maybe not surprising. And I don't know if that was actually for PE. I forget. I forget why this was done. So pulmonic valvular stenosis, pretty nice case of that. Last case is a patient that was followed for quite a long time, an elderly patient with a mass. Here it is on radiography. So we go back to 2018. This is from 2018 as well. And <clears throat> this will give you a nice feel for where it's located in the mediastinum, primarily adjacent to the right atrium. You can see that it has more solid components and components that are either frankly cystic or at least less attenuating than the solid components. And I will show you, they followed this over time and eventually we <clears throat> just decided that it was indeed slowly increasing over time. So a couple of images, let's say I'll just take um, this post ghetto two minutes after to give you a feel for the correspondence between the CT and this, which is great in terms of the signal characteristics. PET scan, no surprise that when we look at that, that it looks like this. So there's FDG activity in that anterior portion, a bit of the posterior portion. So I think a very reasonable presumptive diagnosis was made way back when that this is probably, or maybe a phrenic nerve schwannoma, but his diaphragm was never up. But that was the presumptive diagnosis for a long time. And eventually they decided because it was slowly increasing to take it out. And it is not a schwannoma, but it's a thymoma. So it's slightly unusual in location in that place. It's not in the middle or anterior mediastinum, but the pathology is a thymoma, as you see here. So kind of interesting, slow growth over type years of a thymoma. Type A, so that would explain more indolent behavior. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Here's the haste image. All right, interesting case. Those are my cases, Jeff. Thanks, Howard. Yeah. All right, uh, Peter, are you ready? I think I can. Oh, yeah. set. all right. Oh, sorry, Peter, I, I don't care. I, you can go ahead, I just have one, but you yeah. can go ahead and. Well, let's, Peter, okay. let's do your one case, so, and then Seth, you can have the rest of the time. <laughs> okay. I don't, yeah, I don't have a whole lot this week. Just 
one case and it's a uh, kind of a curiosity slash uh, consult. So it was a case that was shown to be by one of my colleagues, um, uh, 18 year old, 18 year old uh, girl. Um, and uh, she, she's been having uh, kind of shortness of breath primarily with the on exertion for several years. Uh, she was given a diagnosis um, of uh, exercise induced uh, asthma. And so this was her uh, CT chest at an outside hospital uh, several months, several months ago. Um, yeah, from July. And um, so that triggered a uh, biopsy. So she got a she had a surgical biopsy done. Uh, this is a follow-up CT, and you can see the biopsy sites, the wide uh, wide resections. Um, and uh, these are the findings on pathology. So air, airway centered fibrosis, uh, inflammation, uh, and then some features of uh, follicular bronchiolitis. Although it seems like they didn't uh, completely. Can you make that big, Peter? No, just make that one big. Peter, I don't, know, I don't know if I can. I don't know. I'm not sure how to make that bigger. Uh, just um, this, make. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I guess. That's, good. But, That's good. Yeah. So a bunch of lymphoid seems like mononuclear cells, lymphoid follicles, uh, germinal cell. Centers and then um, a differential was brought up. So this is the, this is our our pathology. She uh, the pathology had initially been sent to Mayo, and then they also didn't come up with the. They kind of came up with the same thing: airway centered uh, inflammation. Uh, didn't have a definite diagnosis, but this is this, this is what our our guys suggested um, for workup: uh, connective tissue disease, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's. Um, obviously, that would be associated with the LIP. Uh, pattern and then uh, immunodeficiencies and then so she she was she was worked up for both of these uh, both of these uh, kind of clusters of conditions and she was negative for any autoimmune so the whole autoimmune panel was negative seen by rheumatology didn't have any history and then no findings of immunodeficiency either she was seen by immunology allergy immunology so mm -hmm. yeah so any ideas Guys, I suppose they're no, I don't. I mean, usually, if you have that kind of <clears throat> follicular bronchiolitis, they certainly think of immune conditions because you've got your lymphoid follicles and germinal centers. And I just generally think of the things that they mentioned too connective tissue disorder, yeah, immune, yeah. immunodeficiency states. You know, it's interesting this airway centered interstitial fibrosis is this. Entity, and whenever a pathologist says it, in every single instance, I have no idea what the imaging is. Um, yeah. And I've seen this airway-centered interstitial fibrosis shown with numerous patterns of things that some of it looks like, you know, more constrictive bronchiolitis-ish. Some looks more central lobular nodularity-ish. I mean, I, someone has to do a good RADPATH paper on this because yeah. they they mention this all the time. And every time they mention it, I look at the imaging, I'm like, I don't know what this is. And I don't know what air, air, airway center interstitial fibrosis is. Um, I, I'm still not even sure what it means. So uh, yeah. I talked to our pathologist about that because I think it was described back in the, I want to say like the mid 2000s by uh, Dr. Usum. I think he was at, uh, was he at Pittsburgh or something? Yeah. And Pittsburgh, I think. Yeah, and going back and looking at that, I wonder if a lot of those cases are fibrotic HP. Um, I suspect not all of them, but I think many of them have <laughs> been fibrotic HP. Because when I see anything airway centric, that's you know any whatever it's whether it's chronic interstitial inflammation or fibrosis, I think about that. But connective tissue disease is definitely up there as well. And yeah. Peter, I agree with what your pathologist suggested. Uh, yeah. The, but if you're seeing the lymphoid follicles and you know findings suggestive of you know follicular bronchiolitis, mm -hmm. you know that's a very separate entity. Um, right, but, but I, just, I but I wonder they, if, when you have the two mixed, if that really pushes you towards connective tissue disease. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So one thing we kind of threw around is could this be a uh, just kind of some kind of idiopathic pen bronchiolitis? But they. It seems like the pathology doesn't really fit, and I haven't seen many imaging examples of that. 
I showed one last week of diffuse panbronchiolitis. It looks like diffuse what your case looks like, but the pathology was 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 very different. I mean, they were going down a uh, there were tons of histiocytes. They were going down right. sort of a storage disease, Erdheim Chester, which all turned out to be negative, but it involved the full thickness of the of the airways. Um, and it looks like the, the diffuse panbronchiolitis. But the image yeah. unfortunately isn't specific to it. Yeah, and then the um, yeah, and when I just, I just kind of looked at the path for the panbronchiolitis, seems like it's a lot of separative uh, inflammation with neutrophils also, which didn't mention any neutrophils on this path. So it doesn't, I don't know, pathology seems like it wouldn't fit with that. And then um, the other thing we thought about it could this be just an IPATH where she hasn't uh, manifested yet with some kind of autoimmune process uh, looming in the future. Still and the young. description of the pathology was, as I used the word blue, it's a blue biopsy, which means that the cellular abnormality dominates. Right. The process is small. So one of the things I'll probably think about is even if we don't have a diagnosis, should we treat the patient with an immunosuppressor regimen to yeah. with those lymphocytes? Yeah, so she was on steroids. She's been on prednisone, but hasn't, um, hasn't helped. A whole lot, but they are thinking about. I guess they haven't put her on any other immunosuppressants, but yeah. right, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you can always put her on one of them, not the heavy duty one, and then re image and follow her yeah. clinically. Yeah. yeah, how things go, even without a particular diagnosis beyond follicular bronchiolitis, right? Well, that's all I have, guys. Interesting. Well, okay, Interesting. the path is really neat. Yeah. Um, all right, Seth, you ready? So, yeah, <clears throat> kind of be a little bit of a mess because I'm trying to do this on numerous applications. Okay, let's start with one bit more. And I'm sorry, I'm home today, so I have to deal with this slow server. So this was a person sent to us for CTEF evaluation. Um, their findings that there are scattered areas of thrombus. I just kind of showed you one, but they, and they were there. But another little thrombus here. But the imaging overall, the, the morphology, the PAs um, are a little strange. There are these very uh, pronounced tortuous vessels, which you can get. I, a lot of the soft tissue appears kind of around the vessel, um, but. Again, I'm sorry that the thing is scrolling very poorly, but one of the things we noticed on the initial CT, this CT, was if I slowly worked my way down to the coronaries, that the coronaries were just massive, like they're just these huge coronaries. Um, so we recommended that they get a CT, but um, of course they didn't really listen to us and they got a MRI and the MRI was done when um, we weren't there. We had someone on that wasn't us and uh, let me see if I can oop, loop this thing. Um, and what you can see are, and this is for all the coronaries, these just massive coronaries. Um, flow is retrograde, appropriate direction through the coronaries. Um, we couldn't see any fistulas. So it was interesting because initially when we saw the CT, we we're going to be, oh, there's going to be some huge fistula. But in fact, there wasn't. All the coronaries were just massive. And we actually calculated through various mechanisms, both direct flow through the coronaries and also um, the uh, difference between flow through the uh, aortic root at the level of the valve and then the aortic uh, aorta above the sinotubular junction. And both of them gave us uh, 40 mLs. Basically, about a third of the patient's blood flow was going through the coronaries. But again, we didn't see any specific fistula per se. So then we finally said, hey guys, get a CT. We don't really know what's going on here. And the CT answered some questions, but um, kind of, and again, I, I really I tried to, why I wanted to show some of these on PACS. 
because it would just show a lot easier. So first of all, we have a, a for better or worse, every, you know, we have a anomalous coronary. Um, technically, it would fall under the interarterial, the right, but there's no real narrowing of it. And again, this patient was older, but you can see these, she's all the coronaries are massive, the LED, the circumflex. And what was interesting is if when you get down through the coronaries, you can see that these coronaries, there's this avid feeding of the walls. And then in all these areas, you see flashing of blood kind of along the uh, subendocardial contour where a lot of these small coronaries are. And you can see them from all the vascular distributions. Um, and so it was basically numerous coronary cameral fistulas. So all of these vessels feed into the chambers. Um, and, you know, only a small percent. So there are fistulas. They're just these tiny, tiny little fistula that are basically going into the chambers, into the left ventricle more than the right ventricle. Again, you can see these little flashes here. And if, if I had smooth transition, you would see portions of these acute marginals just feeding into the vessels as well as the LAD. Now, the patient did undergo a cath. And, you know, unfortunately, because, oh my Lord, I, I can't open a, a single, are you, is this thing saying I can't even open? This is crazy. They, they lock everything down. I can't even open a JPEG on here to show you the uh, corner. This is crazy. To show you the coronary CT uh, or co uh, the coronary cath. But if I could show the video, which is a lot more impressive, or the coronary cath, which even the still pictures, which are nice, but it doesn't seem like I can do that here. Um, let me see if I can dump them into PowerPoint real quick. Show them that way. That would be at least some benefit. Nice something here. Sorry about this. Uh, okay, so this will work to some degree, not the best, but here you go. And again, it, it's much more, it's much prettier, more impressive when I can actually show you the cath. But here are these vessels from the RCA, um, and you can see all this flooding into the uh, chamber. Um, and it also occurs along the LAD as well. It's a little harder to see on this. And also I, it was, I was struggling my butt off to capture it. But if you played it through, you would see just all this feeding. So we, we had never seen this before, but there are case reports um, of numerous, of all three vessels developing coronary cameral fistulas. Um, and it's extraordinarily rare. There's like two case reports in the literature. Now, how this relates to the patient's um, pulmonary hypertension, we're not entirely sure. There is a shunt. I mean, there is a left to right shunt from the coronaries going into the RV, but it's by no means, you know, it, it's like, uh, you know, tw you know, QPQS of like 1.3 or 1.4. It's something that probably shouldn't cause this degree of pulmonary hypertension. Nonetheless, we're not really sure exactly what's going on. They, they're going to take the patient for um, pulmonary thromboendarterectomy because they're thinking that maybe some of the clot in these PAs are leading to some of the issues, although I, I, I kind of doubt that. But at least I took the, told the surgeon to take some nice pictures of the coronary arteries when he's in there. I, I mean, I don't know if anyone is, you know, we see coronary cameral fistulas in uh, pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum. Uh, when you have RV dependent circulation, usually I've shown a couple cases of that over the years. Um, I've just never heard of or seen this involving all the coronaries. So weird case, um, not really 100% sure what's going on or how the coronary flow is related to the pulmonary hypertension. And she is pulmonary hypertensive. Um, but anyways, that that's a weird one. Mm, very, really weird. Yeah, and this one is <clears throat> this one is just not going to do well trying to show it here. Um, but you know, we always need to be cognizant of the top of our scans. Um, you know, this is a. This is a belly scan from 
2016, 2017, where, you know, this wasn't mentioned. I mean, again, we will also occasionally miss stuff on the belly portion, but uh, there's a mass here. And this isn't, you know, an obscure diagnosis by any means. Um, it's just a very pretty example of a, uh, of a myxoma. Uh, so beautiful, you know, these are characteristically quite hyper intense on T2 weighted imaging due to the myxomatous elements. Uh, T1 weighted imaging, you know, they're, they're classically, you know, iso intense to muscle, which this is. Um, there's a little area, there are some areas of necrosis in this guy centrally. Uh, post, sorry about that. Again, this is just not ideal. Post contrast, they're gonna enhance because they are, they are tumors and this just did enhance. Uh, let me see if I can get a, a decent shot of this without having to load up the 10,000 sequences that are here that are generated. Um, I mean, again, this is just a delayed enhancement through the mass, which, which isn't super helpful. Um, you know, you could use, uh, obviously, if you want to differentiate between clot and tumor, uh, delayed imaging is a good is a good option, but we clearly know this is a tumor attached to the intraatrial septum in the region of the fossa ovalis. Um, see if I can get a, a cine up here very quickly without wasting everyone's time trying to load this thing. Um, but, you know, myxomas are, are by far the most common primary cardiac tumor. Uh, I don't know why. We just have not seen a cardiac mass in a really long time. I, I don't know. They're, they're clearly around. Um, when I was at Maryland, you know, we were the referral center for multiple states. Here, I just don't think that's the case. So this thing was, you know, you have the ones that present earlier, the ones that tend to be either larger or prolapse have a larger stock. And if I had the time, I could just flip through the, uh, the delayed imagings. And on the delayed imaging in the region of the fossil valves, you'll see this bright area of enhancement attached to the wall. So even though you don't see a perceptible stock, there, there basically is a stop stock pathologically. But then you have ones that are highly mobile that are prolapsed through the uh, left atrium during diastole and obstruct inflow. And those are the patients who present earlier with um, edema and usually young, characteristically young patients. Uh, and then you have other patients who present with stroke, and that's because they have the villus forms, which have these little projections off of them, which we know embolize everywhere. Uh, but the ones that don't have those findings, i.e. don't obstruct inflow or don't embolize, you know, usually they're asymptomatic um, and are found incidentally, like this guy who was, who was in his 60s. So um, the imaging is, again, I didn't show all of it. The imaging is actually quite pretty, but again, difficult to show on the, my current system at home. Uh, this is another case of pulmonary hypertension. Again, nothing special about this case. It's just a very nice example of uh, in situ thrombus in a patient with uh, pulmonary hypertension from longstanding uncorrected con congenital heart disease. So one thing that can be hard and I found somewhat difficult is uh, initially when I started um, was differentiating in situ thrombus from uh, chronic thromboembolic disease. Uh, and, and it can be hard. And, um, you know, one thing I realized is that going through like a lot of my case archives from Maryland, that there was a lot of stuff that was clearly in situ thrombus that we call a chronic thromboembolic disease. And now being where I am, I, I realized that we made this mistake for, and a lot of people make this mistake, even kind of people that are, um, you know, very good at imaging. And it, it's, it can be hard. I mean, you have a lot of times the insight to thrombus isn't obstructive. It's circumferential around, it, even if it's not circumferential, it doesn't cause the vessels dilated and not contracted, right? So CTEF contracts vessels. And it's either lentiform or circumferential. Uh, the other big clue is A, this patient has congenital heart disease. So th this patient has Eisenmangers. You can see for better or worse, that there's flow across this large uncorrected ASD. This was bidirectional. This patient did have eyes and minders. Um, in the absence of that, the really two times you see this are either in uncorrected congenital heart disease, where you have that history, as in this case, or the other case, which is really pulmonary arterial hypertension. And those are the ones that are hard to differentiate, those with PAH and those with CTEF. Um, 
one of the best clues, I think, is the degree of uh, calcification of the vasculature. So here you can see um, the extensive calcification of the pulmonary arteries due to basically, it's basically atherosclerotic disease. Um, so the PA pressures are so high that just like you do with other forms of you actually develop atherosclerotic disease in the uh, pulmonary arteries. Um, and that is extraordinarily uncommon in CTEF. We'll occasionally see calcifying clots, but you're not going to see um, calcification to this degree. So the only two times you really see calcification to this degree, again, are PAH and um, uncorrected congenital heart disease. Uh, a lot of the literature says you only see it in uncorrected congenital heart disease, but that's just wrong. I mean, I think we've all seen bad cases of PAH where we see this in. Um, I have other cases. Unfortunately, it's just going to be so difficult showing them. I, I have to, when I start working Thursdays again, I will um, show a lot better cases uh, because yeah, it's hard for home. But do you guys have any other methods that you use to uh, distinguish between these uh, entities? No, just that, <clears throat> just what you described is how I think about it too. Yeah. So um, on the cases that you're not sure about, how does what's the how do you confirm or how do you like what's the gold standard though? Yeah. So the gold standard is, um, uh, you know, so VQ scan, as much as I dislike it, is you know if they want to know, the VQ scans will be pretty representative. Um, it's very uncommon to have uh, abnormal findings on VQ scan. Um, you can. I have seen, and I have shown cases here where you have patients with really bad um, lining thrombus that they do develop obstruction. The other thing, I mean, most of the time we're saying, okay, you know, this is not CTEF, right? The vessel's dramatically expanded. Um, it's got this lining thrombus and it's circumferential, and it's just not what CTEF looks like. Uh, the other thing that is extraordinarily helpful for at least the surgeons who can immediately distinguish between them is on uh, catheter direct catheter angiography. Again, not my not my in my wheelhouse, but for us, I think, um, and also the hemodynamic like the, the hemodynamics get pretty complex and is beyond my understanding. Um, but the hemodynamics and the response um, that they do when they do CPET with you know with exercise. Uh, they can be quite different. The other issue is that you do have people with mixed disease. So, I mean, here again is another vessel where you see the circumferential mural thrombus. You do have people who truly have both PAH and CTEF or congenital heart disease and CTEF. Um, but, uh, you know, the surgeons don't like doing those cases because most of the time they find out they, it's really hard to do an intimal resection on these patients. It doesn't, you know, it's it's calcified. It's it's really stuck down. It doesn't react like it does when they do an intimal resection in CTEF, and they will get very upset if we kind of miss the ball on this. Um, so a long answer to your thing, I think, is uh, VQ scan is helpful, and as is, I think, if on the MCT, if you can differentiate, I think catheter angiography in the hands of a very subspecialized center who sees this all the time is also quite helpful. But again, the calcific you're just not going to see this calcification in, in CTEF. Yeah, so the only other, yeah, along those lines, I mean, the cases I've seen tend to have these large, just massive central clots, which just doesn't look like a CTEF picture, especially if it's unilateral or strikingly asymmetric. But the calcification, I agree, is most helpful. I, yeah, we do surprisingly some you know a decent amount of unilateral ctef like stuff that were like that looks like car uh, sarcoma or stuff and it's mm -hmm. it's unilateral or strikingly asymmetric yeah. um we did we have cases that we whatever we have this classification that are level one on one side meaning like in the main pas and completely absent on the other or level one on one side and like you know level distal subsegmental on the other we're actually writing a paper on those um but uh, it's uncommon, but we do see that. Cool. All right. Anyways, guys, I'm sorry. The the. No, it worked out fine. The, yeah. the corner two 
thermal fistula case, if I could show like all the imaging and fluid motion was really, really cool. You can actually, um, but uh, yeah, anyways. Cool. Well, thanks, Seth. Uh... Okay. All right. Well, it's almost the hour anyway, so good timing on that. Good discussion and really cool cases this week. Um, again, we're off next week for um, for the Christmas holiday week, um, but uh, if enough people are around the following week, um, I'll be here. We can definitely have um, a conference right before the new year.